Hi, this is Justin from the Methodist School of Music. You're about to watch an edited skills training webinar entitled Audio Editing in GarageBand. As the video is quite long, there are timestamps to help you navigate the various sections so that you can jump to and fro parts of the webinar that you might need help revising. Please consider subscribing and hitting that bell notification button so that you will receive content like this the minute it comes out. You may also consider bookmarking our Facebook page as well so that you'll be kept up to date on upcoming webinars and events and to sign up for them so that you can be a part of all this training. If you have a question, I'd encourage you to write it down in the comment box below. This is so that everyone can benefit from the discussion. However, if you do need to privately ask a specific question from your ministry context, you may write to us via the email address in the description box below. So grab that coffee, open up your notebook, and get ready to learn. Okay, uh, thank you everyone. It's uh, quite exciting for me to see so many people here. Um, and uh, what's going to happen now is I'm going to share my screen. So uh, before, I get, before I get started, just a, a quick uh, brief. Uh, I will be... I will be swapping between two main applications. So one will be my set of PowerPoint slides, which I understand that will be, uh, it will be mailed out to you, I think, at the end of the, the session. So you have a copy for reference. Um, and I will be referring to the slides as I go along. And of course, I will also be uh, alternating between looking at the slides as well as uh, GarageBand, of course. So uh, there, was, there will be certain things where I will be demonstrating and, and trying to show you live. So, um, Without further ado, I'm, I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, so uh, welcome to mixing in GarageBand. Uh, I mean, you know, audio editing, but uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. Um, so here's a quick overview about what we are going to cover in the duration of uh, tonight's seminar. So firstly, I will talk uh, a little bit about, about sound, right? Because when we are doing, dealing with music, we want to know uh, a few things about sound before we begin. Um, secondly, I will talk about mixing. Uh, what exactly is mixing? And what exactly are we doing when we say we are editing and we are mixing a, a song? Um, thirdly, uh, I will talk about some basic principles uh, to keep in mind when we are doing uh, our mixing. And then fourthly, I will cover the components in the mixing process, right? So at this point in time, uh, the components in the mixing process, I will also then um, go into GarageBand in the app to show you um, how uh, each component is sort of uh, manipulated or, or, or uh, used or applied, right? Uh, which translates into the, the last point, which is the actual mixing workflow. Okay, so, so along the way, uh, I will refer back to the components, right? And I will use the same order of the components as I talk about it first. So there will be the theory component. And then uh, I will also show you then how I apply it to an actual uh, situation, a, a mixing situation. Okay, about sound. Now, uh, how is sound measured? So what is the unit of measurement? So I think uh, some of us may know. Uh, the unit of measurement is actually in decibels and we want to keep this in mind because um, every uh, little adjustment that we make will be measured in, in, in decibels. So every adjustment that we make in the mixing process uh, and in GarageBand and I think in, in most of your other digital audio workstations as well, uh, the adjustments go as fine as I think 0 0.1 decibels. Okay, now uh, amplitude and frequency. So, I mean, those of us who have gone through the Singaporean education system, uh, this is part of like the physics curriculum in secondary school. But I mean, it's okay if you know you, you don't remember. But what you have to keep in mind tonight, what is important tonight is uh, what amplitude and frequency translate to. So frequency here uh, is measured in hertz, right? So that's the, the unit of measurement. This will be important later when we talk about equalization or EQ because we will be looking at graphs. Okay, so what is important for us? Amplitude correlates to loudness. So the, when we see a, a waveform or the, the form of the audio that is being captured, uh, the, the larger the amplitude, the, the larger the, the loudness. And uh, when we talk about frequency, we are, also, we are actually talking about pitch. 
right, the, the, the pitch of the sounds uh, along the frequency spectrum. Okay, just very briefly, uh, there are three primary segments in, in audio production. Uh, you have the recording phase, right, where you actually use a mic or an, an audio interface uh, and, and your laptop or your computer to process uh, the recording. Um, the second phase is the mixing phase, right? What, what goes into the production of a song, for example? There are different elements, right? You record different instruments, and each of these instruments uh, constitute a, a track, right? And then you are putting these tracks together uh, in the mixing process. And lastly, there's a, a process called mastering, uh, which we don't have to be too concerned about uh, right now. Later, I will sort of touch very briefly about it right at the end. When we are talking about exporting our song out, uh, out from GarageBand once we are done mixing. Okay, so here is what tonight is all about, right? What is mixing? So mixing a song is simply the, the blending of the various instru uh, instruments, sorry, the various individual components, right, which uh, are largely instruments, into a whole, right, that sounds as good as possible. Right, so on their own, it may be uh, vocals, it may be harmony parts, uh, and you may have various instruments. So in your typical contemporary worship setting, you have uh, the rhythm section, so the bass and the drums, and you have the acoustic guitars, you have keyboards, you have synthesizers. So all these come together, uh, and in the recording process, they are recorded uh, as separate individual tracks. So what you're really doing when you're mixing is to uh, make all of them sound good together. So this final mix, or what uh, some engineers would call a, a mix down, thus consists of multiple tracks. So uh, the mix also may be referred to as a multi-track recording, right? where uh, there are multiple tracks that are being recorded. So these uh, tracks are then typically voices or instruments. right? So considering our setting, uh, voices or instruments, and depending on the genre that you perhaps listen to, I don't know, for some electronica, then you have more synthesized or synthetic kinds of sounds, right? They are not sort of produced by instruments. Right, so now we uh, come to some basic principles. Uh, the, the simplest thing that I can uh, recommend is to listen widely, listen widely to uh, various uh, uh, genres, uh, various worship artists, uh, because how you mix will primarily depend on what kind of music you, you listen to. So uh, what I'm saying is, you know, if you listen to a lot of hip hop or if you listen to a lot of classical music, it's, it's kind of challenging to try to mix uh, what a rock arrangement would sound like. Uh, the, the greater your listening variety, as I, I've said here, the better then your understanding of um, what kind of sound you sort of aim your mix to, to, to want to uh, sound like. So um, these days we have Spotify uh, and, and you know really the whole gamut of like you know worship artists and, and even all kinds of genres of music are uh, really at the, the touch of a button. So uh, this is the first thing that I would, I would recommend for us to do. So of course if uh, we are here and you know our purpose is to sort of mix for church right uh, or to step up you know in these times because most of our worship has been uh, uh, in in this context been changed into a pre-recorded setting and and there is a need for more people to be able to learn this skill of being able to mix songs so that they can be presented for worship service then what you would want to do is to listen to a variety of worship artists not just you know the top 10 or like the christian hits or, or whatever so that you can have a better understanding of the, the, the sound production and the, the kinds of sounds that different artists have. Okay, the second principle is uh, the making of space. So if a mix consists of multiple instruments, uh, the idea is for every instrument to be heard. Um, so for the song to sound good, you want each track to, to be discernible, not just discernible, but you, you want it to have its own space. So, so this idea of its own space is, is something that we need to keep in mind when we are mixing. Uh, and, and this is something that can be achieved through a variety of ways. So later when I talk about the components of 
uh, the mixing process, uh, some of these ways would be dealt with. So, so things like EQ, uh, things like you know applying some kind of compression. Uh, later, I'll elaborate a little bit more about how to achieve this uh, space. So something that I also forgot to say before I, 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 I talk about the quick note, uh, I just want to make a, uh, put a disclaimer out there. You know, I, I'm no pro audio engineer. You know, I don't do this for a living. So I'm, I'm kind of like a hobbyist trying to share my knowledge because of uh, some experience and uh, my passion for sound in general uh, and, and, and music. So uh, we're not going to win. I know I'm not helping you to win any Grammys, you know, or, or to become some uh, top-notch producer. And, and one other thing I want to say is that sound can be very subjective and different people may hear different things. So what you want to do is, you know, find one or two friends, you know, uh, maybe sound guys in, in your church, you know, the, the guys always at the back uh, of the century doing all the, the mixing and the, you know, uh, you go and talk to some of them and I think they can help you along this journey because uh, you want a pair of ears that you can trust to give you feedback on your mixing. Okay, a uh, quick note before actually attempting the mix. Um, use closed back headphones. So uh, if, you, if you see like uh, my video screen and Justin's video screen, we are using uh, headphones that uh, do not leak sound out. Yeah, so it's, it's, these are called closed back headphones uh, or even earphones. Right, uh, for the simple reason that you know you don't want everyone to hear when you know you're you're mixing, but also because uh, if you are using close back headphones, you can actually hear uh, you know maybe you can pick up more details, uh, the small details. Uh, for example, you know environment noise that needs to be removed, you'll be able to sort of hear it more accurately. Um, there are some uh, headphones in the market that have a certain frequency emphasis. So, so uh, I don't know what beats sound like now. Uh, so in, in my mind, they, they always sort of are marketed at, you know, the people who listen to a lot of uh, specific genres and, and they are sort of commonly known to be very bass heavy. So if you're using uh, headphones that are sort of emphasizing a certain frequency spectrum, then you want to be a little more careful because you, you need to sort of compensate for the mix. If your headphones are, are giving you a, extended sort of uh, bass emphasis then you might want to sort of mix your bass frequencies a, a little sort of less intensely or less volume right uh, so one way to get around this is to listen to a familiar track or familiar song that you maybe you are very you you you, you know the song very well you've listened to it multiple times over multiple settings so um, to find out if your headphone has a certain frequency emphasis. Okay, so envisioning a stereo space. Now, what, what is a stereo space? Uh, stereo refers to, uh, the stereo space refers to uh, uh, an imaginary space that is created by two loudspeakers, right? So if you, if you go to buy uh, uh, loudspeakers or, or monitors or uh, uh, so he headphones also produce a kind of stereo space, right? You have your left ear cup and you have your right ear cup. So a stereo space is created by uh, two sources of sound, right? On, on the left and on the right. So um, what I, I want to help us see or envision, this is important because this uh, will help us in learning how to mix. So there are three axes, axes, right? X, Y, and Z. Later, I, I have a diagram in the next slide to sort of help you envision. But for now, uh, the X axis, right, is your horizontal axis, right? So from the left to right, uh, sounds can uh, exist anywhere along this horizontal line, right? And this relates to uh, the concept called panning, right? So panning is moving your sound from the left to the right. Okay, later I'll talk a little bit more about this. Uh, the y-axis is your vertical axis. So the vertical axis uh, is the, the sounds that uh, correlate to frequency or pitch. So uh, typically, the higher the pitch, the, in, in your imaginary, in the, in the stereo space, it will be sort of uh, higher up in the y-axis. So you don't see that the, you don't imagine when you are listening to music that your bass comes out at you from, from the ceiling, right? The, the bass is always at, on, 
at the floor level or you know base is always felt and you imagine it to be closer to the bottom uh, so as the as the pitch goes up or as your frequency increases uh, the the sounds begin to occupy higher higher places in the y axis okay and then your z, your z axis your 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 z or your z axis your z axis is the movement of sounds or is your depth right so the movement of sounds from the front to the back so typically um the lead vocals or the the, the lead vocalist or your worship leader will be uh sitting right in the front of the mix of the song right the the the, the lead vocalist will be carrying uh the main sort of the job of delivering the the song so uh Typically, he would be the loudest and he would be right in front. So then you have um, backup vocalists or people who are singing harmony. Uh, and when you adjust their volume, typically they will be slightly less loud, right? It would be, uh, it would be uncommon to have your backup vocalist sing uh, as loud or louder than your, than your worship leader, typically. Right, so I have a, uh, I drew this myself. I'm quite proud of this. So uh, a diagrammatic uh, visualization. So the movement of sounds along the y-axis correlates to the frequency or the pitch. Higher the pitch, the higher on the y-axis it will be. Uh, x-axis is your panning, right? The movement of sounds from left to right. And then the z-axis would be the volume. So the louder the, the, the track or the instrument is, the more uh, the closer to the front it will be the softer it is the the closer to the back it will be all right so now we are here at the components of the mixing process so uh there are a lot of terms here so don't don't panic i i have the the definitions of these terms and later on when i'm actually going through the mix as well uh i will be uh, demonstrating and uh, if need be I will also elaborate a little bit more uh, along the way while I am demonstrating uh, and in the slides after this slide uh, I will also uh, have one or more slides for each of these components so right now just think of it as this is you know this is like the, the theory component that you want to sort of familiarize yourself with so that later when I'm referring back to this uh, you you will not feel so lost. Okay, so number one is uh, balancing. So what is balancing? Balancing is the adjusting of uh, individual track volumes. So typically, if you are mixing a song and when you record uh, different instruments or when people send you recordings of, say, their voices, uh, the, the level at which they record uh, may not always be uh, at a threshold that is immediately usable. So what, what I mean is that sometimes, you know, if somebody sends you a vocal recording, if he's singing too close to the mic, it's going to be recorded real loud. And so when you are, when you first look at the mix, you know, once you have imported all your tracks into GarageBand, uh, the first thing you want to do is try to sort of adjust each uh, track's volume to make sure that all of your tracks can be heard, right? So because if one or more tracks are, are extremely loud, then that would either sort of drown out the other tracks and, and some tracks may not be uh, discernible. Okay, so this is balancing. So this is the first thing to, to, to do. The second thing, uh, uh, this is a pretty important aspect later. I will, uh, I think, dwell a little bit more on on this uh, idea of eq or equalization so uh, what is equalization so for every sound and every instrument and every track um, you can further fine tune or uh, to put it simply you can tweak the sound in order for it to sit better inside the mix or you can tweak the sound to make it sound different so that the instrument or the voice can be heard a little better or if there are some unwanted artifacts 
So later I'll talk a little bit about this if there are, so, say for example, very harsh treble sounds or very harsh uh, S sounds, right, which is known as sibilance. Uh, EQ will help you to remove these harsh sounds so that your track sounds better. Okay, so that's equalization. So number three, uh, compression, right? So compression is, as the word suggests, to, uh, to make something uh, smaller, right? Uh, I, I also added two words there. Uh, don't have to be too uh, concerned about not, not knowing that, that the word in the brackets. What you just need to know is uh, dynamics refer to loudness, right? So if someone says, you know, oh, what's the dynamic range of, of this song or if this, of this instrument? It means what's the, 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 the largest difference between the softest part and the loudest part of the track? So uh, what compression does is for every track or every uh, recording, uh, there may be very soft sounds. And maybe at the choruses, the, the vocalist, for example, is singing really loud, like, you know, he's really emotional and he's just blasting into the mic. Uh, you, are, you are at a dilemma because if you raise the volume so that the, the soft sounds can be heard, uh, your chorus gets too loud. And if you reduce the, the chorus volume across the whole track, then your, at your beginning, you won't be able to hear the, the, the vocalist singing. So what, what you do then is to, is to apply compression to the track. So what compression does is uh, it lessens the range between the quietest and the loudest parts of the track so that the track achieves a, a greater consistency uh, across the song, right? So then that will make your job of mixing uh, a little easier. Of course, compression uh, in GarageBand is quite a, a simple process. I will demonstrate later. Uh, if you move on to other DAWs or uh, you move on to Logic Pro X, which is uh, GarageBand's bigger brother, which needs to be paid for, uh, you will have different kinds of compressors, right? Compressors are the things doing the compression uh, and you have different parameters to adjust uh, and different types of uh, types and uh, uh, yeah, uh, adjustments to make. But we're not going into that because in GarageBand, uh, compression is uh, quite a straightforward process. Number four is uh, reverb. Okay, so you may be familiar with this, uh, with this word if you talk to uh, your sound guys. Uh, it's short for reverberation. So reverb refers to the simulation or the replication of natural acoustic spaces. So uh, when you sing, for example, in, in, a, in a home studio, uh, so for example, I record my, my, my singing or my music in my study room. So the natural reverb space would be the space of the study room. So ideally, right? Ideally, the when you are recording vocals, uh, if you go to a studio to record, you you they may have like a vocal booth or or something where uh, all kinds of reflections of sounds are absorbed. Uh, I think in one of the previous seminars, if you have attended Justin's seminar, uh, he recommends to to record the singing, <laughs> covering yourself in a blanket, right? Because the idea is that you want to absorb uh, any unwanted sound except for your singing voice, right? Then you can apply uh, the reverb uh, uh, a bit more accurately, right? You don't have to factor in, say, the natural reverb uh, that's coming from your, your studio or from your room, right? So these natural acoustic spaces, reverb uh, is typically defined by the, the size of the space, right? Or rather the, the, the timing of the reverb. So if you are looking at the, the parameters to adjust, so just think of it as, uh, uh, you know, placing yourself either singing, say, in, in a small room, there's a short reverb, uh, or a big cathedral or a large hall that would constitute a, a large reverb, a large reverb space, right? So um, the default reverb that you can apply to uh, in your garage band uh, tracks is actually a small room reverb. Right, is to make your, your recording sound less dry, 
less uh, raw. So later I will show it. I'll show that as well. Now number five is panning, or, or what audio engineers would refer to as imaging. Uh, placing the sound along the x-axis. So remember just now I said that there's a stereo space, right? When you listen to any, any song. And, and so panning allows you to move your sound or your track anywhere from the left to the right. Uh, along this 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 axis actually um it's not a strict kind of x y uh you are actually listening to a kind of a a, a semicircle i think if 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 i'm not mistaken so the the panning knob actually is a, is a literal knob i think kind of like a, a semicircle la, but for for ease of illustration it's kind of like on the from sounds from the left to the right right left to the center to the right uh, and lastly, a uh, delay and of course other effects, which also are referred to as plug-ins or uh, inserts. So these are basically effects or uh, practically everything here is a plug-in, can be, can be considered a plug-in except your balancing, which is the adjusting of volumes and your panning. Actually, there are panning plug-ins as well. So uh, I will show you that. So practically everything else, two, three, four, and five, and six, these are all can be considered plugins, right? So a, a delay is also uh, uh, an effect which is uh, time-based. So it, it simulates an echo. So it's like when you say a word and then you are in a very uh, echoey kind of space, like a long tunnel or something, and then you can hear the word being repeated long after you have said the word. So this is the, the effect of delay. So uh, uh, when, when I ran a variant of this uh, workshop for my uh, church worship and music ministry, uh, someone had a question which was, you know, then what's the difference between reverb and delay? So I think uh, the difference is that reverb is uh, the, the idea of a, a natural acoustic space which has uh, different surfaces of which sounds can bounce off. Whereas delay is a sort of artificial re repeating of a, of a sound uh, that is closer to a, a, a strict echo. La. So the echo is not, say, an echo in, in, in a special uh, room, but it's just a, a repeating of a sound. So I, I think that's as, as plainly as I can put it. Okay, now setting up your mix session. Okay, so at this point, uh, I, will, I will sort of hop back and forth uh, between PowerPoint and GarageBand. So uh, just a quick run through. Uh, setting up your mix, really, you just open up GarageBand and uh, import the track. So I, I'm presuming when you are mixing, uh, unless you are recording uh, your own music uh, all by yourself, uh, you know, maybe you have, like me, uh, you, you have to work with the worship leaders or the, the vocalists who will be recording their music on their phones uh, and they may send you perhaps over uh, WhatsApp or uh, email. So what you do is, uh, later I'll show you, uh, it's, it's, a very, it's a very simple process of uh, importing the tracks into uh, the different tracks on GarageBand. Uh, so just to run through this quickly, then... Uh, Label your tracks, right? Because you don't want to accidentally uh, edit one instrument when it's actually another instrument that you are dealing with. Number three is to uh, group tracks together. So some natural uh, groupings would be, say, the vocals, uh, uh, acoustic guitars and keyboards and synthesizers uh, and of course the rhythm section which uh, predominantly always is occupied by the bass guitar and the and the drums so that uh, it's really really for easy reference and identification when you are working okay steps four and five uh, are quite important right because uh, you don't you really don't know uh, you know where your the 
you know your musicians are recording how they are recording unless you know you have us you have even even though you you may have some kind of a standard protocol instruction document telling them you know okay how should you record this with what app at what distance uh preferably in what kind of room you know uh you you may get a variety of uh tracks with different quality so what you want to do is to listen to each track um the point of this is to get rid of unwanted sounds or unwanted noise right even though they may be very low level noise that means that the the, the volume of this noise may be almost inaudible right maybe it's like the bus you know my 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 study room is like right in front of like a, a side road but there's a feeder bus that runs through so so i always have this problem like you know sometimes i'm recording in the afternoon and then like there's a bus that, that comes by so you want to get rid of these uh, unwanted sounds so that's where we get to uh, number five which is to edit the individual audio tracks uh, I think this is primarily, I think, for for vocalists especially, right? Uh, number six, I just put a note uh, about mono and stereo inputs. Okay, most of the time when we are uh, recording, we are recording in mono. So mono, as the name suggests, uh, refers to, say, uh, one input or, or one output. And stereo, of course, like what I said about the stereo space, uh, there's two. So in, in professional studios, uh, you know, when you record things like acoustic guitar, they will have two like condenser microphones in a, in a specific uh, 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 pattern in order to pick up a, a stereo uh, sound feel. Uh, but of course, I think some of the, the microphones or audio interfaces that, we, that, that some of you may have uh, allow for stereo recording i think even for the android phones i was just having a conversation with uh, justin before the webinar started uh i think some android phones or some apps recording apps allow you to record in stereo so that gives a, a kind of like a larger sound feel or a feeling that is larger but we typically record in in mono okay uh so i I think at this point in time, I will just briefly run through. So uh, I, I don't presume that every one of you has, you know, gone into GarageBand before and, you know, you know every button. So I'm what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly run through the interface. So the things that you see, the buttons and what they refer to, uh, then I will show you how to import your tracks, then move on to editing and to show you the tools that are available to you. Okay, so uh, here I have uh, GarageBand. Okay, this is uh, one of my original songs for uh, convenience. So what I have here is um, one, two, three, four, five, six tracks. Okay, the, the sixth track here uh, is a drummer track. This is uh, the GarageBand uh, drummer which you can uh, you can create. So this is uh, not in the scope of today's session. So uh, if you're interested, uh, you know, maybe in another session, or you can email me. Uh, but this is a software uh, instrument. So this is not recorded. The others are all uh, recorded instruments. Okay, so when you open GarageBand, this is the interface that you will see. Um, on the left here are very obviously the, the tracks. And when you create a track, you know, you go to track and you create a new track, they will typically ask you, okay, what kind of track is it? And if you have an audio interface, this is where the, audio, the mono and stereo comes in. They will ask you, okay, are you recording with a microphone? So if I'm recording with a microphone, which is the input that I'm using? So my audio interface, uh, you can, we can, I can actually uh, have a dual input. So that means that if I have two microphones, I can actually record, say, like my guitar uh, in stereo. So two rings represent two inputs, which means stereo, right? One ring means mono, one input. 
Okay, so typically it's just a single input. So my microphone is connected to input 4. So if I just click input 4, um, this checkbox, you, if you are using an audio interface, most audio interfaces in the market now uh, give you low latency monitoring. So that means that you, you don't actually have to, that, that means that you can listen to yourself sing in real time without any lag. So this is, I think the checkbox is for you to check if you're not using an audio interface and you are experiencing some kind of a lagging issue. So that means that when you sing and then after like some milliseconds, you, you are hearing your, yourself again. So this is for the, the live monitoring, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so if you click create, uh, the tracks will be labeled generically audio one, audio two, audio three, audio four. So this is what I mean when I say label the tracks. Uh, now I will show you first uh, importing a track. So I right click on this empty space of the track. And what will come out is this option, which is to add audio file. So once I click this, I will be able to hear, so like my downloads or whatever. So I can hear, I can see all this. And if it's an MP3 file or MP4 file, uh, and it's possible for GarageBand to read it, it will uh, appear as, uh, as this. You know, it will not be uh, blacked out, grayed out. Okay, so this is how you import your audio files. So typically, you go to your downloads folder and then you can, you can import whatever uh, you, you want. Okay, so no, now that's all of the way. Uh, let me just briefly run through the interface. So from the top left, I'll move from the top left corner to uh, uh, the, from left to right. La. There is a very helpful button if you forget any of these things. This is the quick help button, which will sort of uh, give you like a prompt as to what some of these things do. So this will kind of help you. I mean, not, it may not be uh, the most helpful. I mean, they may say something, but you know, you, you still don't, you know, it's, it's not always helpful, lah, basically, but you can use it. This is the library. So the library contains presets for some sounds. So if you're recording voice, for example, uh, and I, uh, these are EQ presets, right? So there's a whole selection of different uh, types of vocals that you can play around with. So you just have to note that uh, these presets will change the way uh, that your vocal sounds, okay? There are also presets for acoustic guitar uh, and electric and bass. So these are all for you to sort of uh, play around with. So this is the library function. So preset sounds for uh, certain instruments. This is the smart control button. Okay, over here on the top left. So as you can see, the smart control button pulls up a, a control interface at the bottom half of your screen. Uh, pertaining to this specific track. So what you will see is a, a simplified sort of a layout for you to adjust your compression, which is this compressor over here, your equalization, which is this EQ over here, and your reverb, okay? Uh, this is denoted by the word sense, but you don't have to worry about what that means. We, we will not really talk about this. Uh, but you just have to know later on, I will talk about this uh, ambience and reverb. So these are your reverb options. Right, and this pertain again uh, to only this track. Now this button over here is your editor button, right? So if you are looking to edit a specific track, so for example, if I'm looking at this, this. <laughs> So if I double click this, the editor uh, will automatically launch this window where you can sort of see in greater detail 
right? So you can see the actual waveform itself. And you can then uh, move on to do your editing. Okay, and of course, uh, moving on to uh, the other buttons next to it, you have your uh, rewind, fast forward, uh, going back to the beginning. So that moves the play hit, right? Okay, so this thing is called the play hit. Uh, it moves wherever the audio is played. And if you click this button, during playback, it will, the play hit will always be in the center. On that glorious. So that you, you will always see the play hit and you will know where exactly which part of the song you are at. Okay, of course, this is play and pause. Uh, Usually, I will use the space bar for this uh, operation. And very clearly with the red circle, uh, this is the record button. So this is for you to record your instrument. So you can see uh, under audio 4, which is the active input that uh, when, when I'm speaking, you can actually see the, the, the green meter move. So this is called the, the volume fader or the volume slider, right? So this knob will adjust the, the volume of the input, right? Of course, on my audio interface, I, I have a gain knob as well. So that also controls how much uh, volume is being picked up by the, by the microphone. Okay, beside the record button uh, is the cycle button or the loop button. Now, this is a, a pretty important function because you want to be able to uh, repeat certain portions of the music that you may be working on mixing. So, for example, if I want to mix this beginning portion and I, I don't want to listen to the others, what I can do is, at this level where the numbers are, move your arrow, click on it, and drag it. So this would then help you create a, a specific portion of the song that will be on loop when you press play. He had a form of majesty. No kingly dignity. Then you will just keep repeating yourself. Right, so this is important when you are listening out for, for certain specific things or when you are checking that there are no uh, strange audio artifacts or when you're trying to listen for the different volumes at this specific portion of the song. Okay, uh, these numbers indicate uh, the bar and the 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 bar and the beat. Right, so they tell you where in the song you are as demarcated by the numbers over here. This is the tempo. So actually, when you start a new project, when you open a new project, the uh, GarageBand will prompt you uh, to set the tempo. So this number is in beats per minute. Right, so you set your tempo. Uh, and preferably, you don't change the tempo because I think once you have recorded audio in the project, when you change the tempo, they will also uh, either quicken or make your music slower. So it will sound a bit weird if the, the, there's too drastic a change. Uh, and lastly, here is the, the time signature and the key signature. So what, what is the key that your song is in? Uh, this is important because this has to do with the pitch correction. Okay, uh, Conveniently, it is right here on the left. Later, I will show you. Uh, the pitch correction can be limited to the key. So that means that they will adjust, GarageBand will adjust your the, the pitch of the of the track according to the key that you set. So determine the key because if you suddenly change key now, they will also transpose all the music that is recorded to whatever key that, that you are moving to. So uh, determine the key because that would also determine the pitch correction function as well. Okay, this is a tuning fork. Yeah, or tuning uh, tuner, sorry. Yeah, so there's an inbuilt tuner in case you need to tune your instruments. This is a counting in function. So before you record, there will be a count in. So if this is switched on, there will be, say, a four bar or eight bar count in. 
Yeah, so here you can de determine, oh sorry, one bar or two bar count in. So this is to sort of give you preparation before you, you, you actually start playing any music when you're recording. Okay, and lastly, uh, the musicians, uh, the, the bane of, uh, okay, I sh it shouldn't be the bane of musicians' life, but uh, it's what makes uh, a good musician, sorry, it's what separates a great musician from a good musician, right? The ability to play to the, to the metronome. Of course, when it comes to recording music, it is incredibly important, right? So the metronome reveals how great or how poor a musician you are, right? Uh, Justin is nodding in agreement. So this is incredibly important. Uh, if you attended Justin's previous uh, webinars, um, the person who arranges the, the music or puts the music together, typically uh, there would be a click and cues track Right, so the click track uh, would be the clicks that are played according to the metronome, which is set to the, the speed or the tempo, the number of beats per minute that you have assigned your song. Right, uh, This is important because later uh, in the next slide, I will talk about audio editing, dealing with timing issues. So you know, not, not every you know, musician that you have in your band, the, the reality is not every musician is going to be like some, you know, uh, super virtuoso who is able to sort of play exactly to the beat all the time. Uh, I struggle with that, you know, when I started recording, I, I found out how much I had to work on when I, you know, I look at all the entries like, oh, I need to adjust this. Um, but yes, so this is the metronome. Uh, uh, and also metronome is important because if you want to create a software drama, your music needs to be in time with the metronome. Otherwise, you will not be able to use the software drummer. Yeah, because the software drummer's uh, hits will be synced to the beats in the, in the song. Okay, uh, the, on, the, the knobs on the right. This is not going away. Okay, the, the knobs on the right. Uh, this is a notepad, which I, I, I don't really use. I mean, if I'm making notes, I, I probably make notes elsewhere but this may be useful for you to sort of uh, make some notes about things that you might want to fix um, okay this is the loop pack with garage band comes uh, preset sounds so all kinds of uh, stuff that you can use. yeah so you you have uh, different sounds but they are all pre recorded sounds and uh, I generally don't use any of them but of course you can explore uh, some of these instruments so they have the instruments here and uh, when you click on say piano you have different pre-recorded sounds that you might want to use and uh, these sounds can be looped that means that they can be repeated for the duration of the song or duration of portions of the song um, and lastly here is the media browser so in the media browser if you have music that is on your computer, you can actually uh, drag it into a channel strip. So for example, I have this song by Switchfoot. I can just drag it and drop it here as a strip of music. Yeah, so I, I don't use this. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, you probably kind of like use this I will probably use this if I want to sort of compare like what my final song sounds like against like a like a commercial track or like against like a a track that you are listening to. Yeah. Okay. So this is about it. This is the project volume. So it's it's always uh, by default set at 0, 0.0 dB. Right, you don't want to sort of go over this. This uh, determines the final level output of your of your entire project or your entire mix. So just uh, leave it here. When you are adjusting volumes, always adjust at the track level. Yeah. So there are two different volumes, right? This is the project volume, uh, which you don't have to touch because when you are listening to the playback, you are actually adjusting your computer or your audio interfaces output volume and you are not a, you, are, you have no need to adjust this yeah so for uh, simplicity you should leave this uh, untouched 
Okay, so those are the main um, buttons. We've kind of run through them. Uh, and now we, uh, I'm going to jump back to this. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to label the tracks, right? So this is me, or if you want to do like lead vox or vocals, uh, of course, this one I can delete. This is harmony, I think. So uh, harmony. This is acoustic guitar. So uh, you can label this very simply by double clicking the titles, right? And this is keyboards. Uh, this is bass. Actually, bass guitar will be clearer. And this is the drums. Okay. Okay, so I've labeled my tracks. Uh, I've kind of like roughly grouped them together, right? The vocals, uh, guitar and keys, bass and drums. So my drums usually at the, at the bottom. Okay, listen through individually recorded tracks. So um, I'm going to show you these two buttons, right? Uh, that are useful when you are mixing. So this is the mute button. Uh, when I click this button, the voice is muted. Or this particular track is muted. Okay, and if I just want to hear that particular track, so in order for me to listen through the individual recorded tracks, once you have imported all your tracks, right, uh, I click this solo button. So the solo button mutes everything else and lets you only hear that particular selected track. No kingly dignity. Okay. And, okay, so now we we get to the editing, right? This is the fun part, or rather the, the tedious part. Uh, so cleaning up tracks, there are different problems or issues that are typically associated with, with tracks that may not be recorded in, in, the, in the best environments. So uh, the, the major sort of, uh, uh, the major fault, right, is, probably background noise. Um, then you have things like pitch issues. Uh, breaths, I think, uh, unless you know the singer is really like after every phrase, and like, <gasps> it's usually not that big of a, a problem. Uh, but later, I'll, I'll show you. I mean, you can actually manually cut out the breaths like if, you're, if you're you know OCD or you're very particular. Of course, if you want something to sound as best as it can be, you know, I've actually done it before, like for particular songs um, where the breaths were, you know, once you sort of make it louder and bring it up to a, a commercial level and then you, you can suddenly hear the breaths very obviously. Uh, then just now I mentioned sibilance. So sibilance, uh, not all vocalists would have this problem. Uh, some have this problem uh, to a greater degree, uh, which are harsh S sounds from singing. Uh, typically in like uh, the treble register. So for male uh, guys and, and ladies, female singers, uh, it can occur anywhere from, I think, 2 to 3K to like 8 to 10K, I think. So, so it's, uh, it varies from person to person and might be, uh, there might be a need to identify at which particular frequency region this occurs so that you can better mitigate the problem. Uh, of course, timing issues, right? So uh, this is an important slide because I'm going to show you uh, how you can edit or to sort of uh, reduce all these uh, problematic bits. Okay, it's important because if one track has problematic bits or extra sounds that you that you don't want, when you are putting all the tracks together, right, at your quiet moments or, you know, they, they accumulate. So your track ends up being very noisy even during the quiet moments. So what you want to do is really to, to cut out all this excess noise that you do not want to be in your mix. Okay, so the, the most useful uh, shortcut that I use on GarageBand and on Logic now uh, is Command T. Okay, or your Apple key, Command and T. T for Tiger. So this is what Command T does. I move my playhead. So for example, um, I go to this part of my singing, you will hear that 
uh, there is some background noise. Okay, so I'm going to solo this. You're just going to hear the singing, but before the singing comes in, which is here, you can see some bits here. Okay, I don't know if you want to turn it up, but yeah, there's some wind noise, and then I take a breath here. So these little bits are actually breaths here and here as well. Okay, so what do I want to do with Control or Command T? Command T, if you have a highlighted track, Command T cuts the track or splits it into two. So with this, you can actually uh, remove the breath and your excess noise, right? And then I just click the, once I make sure that this is highlighted, I click the delete button. So when I play he that, had no so immediately you hear the first note, right? Which is he, a bit shaky there. He had no form or majesty. No. So the same goes for, you know, if you're particular, you, you, you have enough lead time and you want to uh, cut out the breaths. Uh, I've done this before. Uh, of course, there are plugins that allow you to sort of de-breath vocalists. Uh, but the, the manual way to do this is to cut out the breaths like this. So I, I split this track and split this track and then I have this middle part selected. This is a breath just to make sure. Oops. Just to make sure that this is a breath. No. Yeah, definitely a breath. Okay, so then I'm going to make sure this is selected and then I cut it. So if you hear this, the breath is gone. No king. So it's much cleaner. I mean, when you actually, if you're going to raise the volume of the, of the vocal, then uh, some of these breaths can actually be heard, especially if the vocal is recording on a, on a good condenser mic. Okay, uh, so that's your cutting. You can also move tracks up and down. So you can select the region and move it to, you know, for whatever reason, if you are starting a new track or uh, if you want to, uh, say, explore having more doubling like your, like your, like your lead vocalist to make him uh, stronger, you can move the tracks as well. Okay, I'm going to bring this back because I want to show you another uh, thing. So I, I've shown you how to remove the breath. So this works for the silences as well. So the silences are when uh, you see that the waveform has only a, a small line, right? This so sometimes if the recording environment is noisy, uh, these small lines will have noise as well. So if you have the time or if you are particular, you can actually eliminate these things. Yeah, so all these lines are all uh, are all silences. Number three is a, a noise gate. Now, what is a noise gate? A noise gate is simply what it is. It is a gate that is supposed to stop any noise from getting in. Okay, so how does this work? So I'm going to use this as a, as a, as an example again. So the noise gate. Uh, is right here under track. So when you double click this, this window pops out. And under track, sorry, not under track. My apologies. It should be under the controls. When you click this, under the controls, which is here, smart controls, You have this thing over here. Okay, I won't show you this first. You have this thing over here called the noise gate. So when you check this box, a noise gate will be applied. Now, how does the noise gate work? The noise gate works uh, with the decibel scale. So as you can see, if I press this slider um, from minus 100 dB, which is... Uh, something that's very soft, you know, nothing is cut out basically, to 0 dB, which is like everything that is under 0 dB is cut out. Uh, there's, a, there's a scale, there's a range. So uh, the higher, the closer I move towards 0, the louder the sounds get cut out. 
signals that are louder or rather the, the voice that is louder gets cut out. So let me just demonstrate this for clarity. He had no form or man. So I'm going to just repeat here. So I'm going to use the loop function. Um, Because I just want to hear how the noise gate works, right? To cut out the background noise. Okay, so here. So you can hear my breath and you can hear the you can hear some wind noise at the back. So I want to try to get to a, a, a level where I eliminate the wind noise, but I retain the signal, right? So somewhere around 30, 30 plus, minus 30 plus dB. So can you hear that? So most of it is actually eliminated, except a little blip over here, right? So I'm going to just move it a little bit more. So maybe 30. So you just have to play around this because what you want to do is for the noise gate to cut out the low level or softer noises at the background, but retain your signal, the, the recorded voice that you want to hear. Okay, so I'm going to remove this so that you can. So if you notice, this is the level at which my breath gets cut out as well, right? So uh, uh, you will have to sort of play around, right? Uh, at which level? Because what you want to do is you will have to, once you check this, you want to check through your entire track to make sure that uh, none of the singing gets cut out. No form or majesty, no yeah, so you see uh, the, the silence here is also cut out. So the noise gate is a faster way, right, that is applied across the track to cut out sounds beyond a certain threshold. So beyond this minus 30 dB, all the sounds will be cut out. Okay. Simple pitch correction. So just now I mentioned setting the key of the project is very important, right, because if I want to apply pitch correction, so I'm going to go back to this lead vocal here. Uh, under track, right? This is where I was going just now. Uh, Garage Band's pitch correction is a very straightforward 0 to 100. So 100 being the most pitch correction being applied and 0 being none. Okay, so if you want, uh, I'm just going to let you listen to a, a short, just a couple of seconds. So I'm not sure if you can hear the difference. So this is without. Had no fee, had no fee. Sorry, uh, this is kind of irritating. Let me extend it a bit more. <laughs> he had no form or majesty. Okay, uh, a little bit more. He had no form or majesty. Okay, and then I apply it to the max, right? So you can hear the. He had no form or majesty. So it's actually fairly subtle, even with 100, right? Even when I bring the slider to 100, uh, but you can hear that some notes become a little robotic. He had no form or majesty. Yeah, the, the he and the meh, right? Because actually of the way that I sing, right? Because my singing has a bit of, of that sliding, right? So, so what the pitch correction is trying to do is to move my, my sliding to the correct pitch, right? So actually for recording, it's better to, uh, I think like people who sing in choir, I think this would be the most recommended, right? Uh, to sing cleanly, right? To hit every note cleanly. Also better for uh, people who are singing harmony as well so that the harmonies will be tighter. Of course, when you are talking about mixing and recording, um, if you are singing, cleanly and you're hitting the notes cleanly, uh, the pitch correction will also be more effective for you. Yeah, so, so uh, of course, when you are using this, you can just adjust and to, to listen to it, to check that uh, there is some pitch correction going on. Uh, of course, I think uh, in Justin we Justin's webinar, so, so he has some recommendations for free uh, pitch correction software that you can actually use together uh, with the GarageBand as well. Okay, lastly, the flex function. Okay, this is uh, the interesting one. So I'm going to go to another track. So my keyboard track. 
and solo it. So if the numbers denote the bars, right, so you can see the entries. So this is my wife's playing, so it's, it's, it's not too bad. I mean, you know, the entries are kind of... So if you see the, the, the divisions of the lines, you see that the, the waves are actually hitting the, the lines. So there's not much that needs to be corrected. So if I go to the acoustic guitar, maybe you'll find more problems here because I played the acoustic guitar. Uh, okay, I know why. I think this has been corrected already. I have done the correction. So if I, okay, so this is where the flex tool is, right? In this window, under your editor, this is your editor. There's this uh, strange uh, DNA helix looking thing, uh, which is the flex. There you have it. I have edited. So if you can see again, the waveforms and the bar lines. This is the unedited. So if it's unedited, it will show up in dotted lines. So okay, la, I mean, not too bad. See, you can play in time mostly. Uh, of course, when it's very, you know, off, then what you can do is, um, so this is a little bit off here. My cursor is now this three, horizontal, uh, three vertical lines and a, and a plus uh, arrow. I click here, and what I can do is I can actually move the the timing of the, of the waveform. So that means that, uh, of course. If it's really off and if you move it drastically, you will notice that there will be empty spaces later on in the track. Right? So this is really for uh, micro adjustments for, for timing. So if it's just a little bit off and you want to just make it more precise, uh, there is a tool actually here in GarageBand that allows you to adjust the timing. So right now it will sound... <laughs> So all the downstrokes of the of the guitar are coming in at the beat. So this makes for a cleaner sounding recording. Okay, so these are the parts that I didn't need to edit. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so this will really help you. Um, again, at this level of editing, you you know you kind of like need the lead time. Uh, of course, if you're working on your own songs and, and you want that precision, you want it to sound the best possible, then this uh, might be an option. So this is one of the tools that you can actually use to, to fix timing issues. Okay, so we've covered all this. Uh, I'm going to move on to the sibilance. Okay, in GarageBand, there's this thing called the de -esser. Okay, but uh, I... I don't quite like it. I don't think it works very well. Uh, and so my suggestion would actually be to isolate the problematic frequency. Um, I will try to, to, to demonstrate this later in the, in the EQ window because later when I talk about EQ, uh, you, can be, you can actually see in real time uh, the singing uh, waveforms and where it sits on the frequency graph. Then you can isolate certain problematic sounds. Okay, so uh, I'm going to run through the what I covered just now, components of the mix. So balancing, uh, this idea of a rough mix, when you import, after you import all the tracks into GarageBand, you want to make sure that you can hear all your tracks. So uh, one of my uh, uh, audio engineering trained friends uh, recommended that this, you test this by moving your uh, control, your output control, uh, volume control, to the very minimum that you can hear. So if you can hear all your tracks that are playing at the same time, uh, you should be ready to start. So, so more or less, you should be able to hear uh, all the tracks. So uh, if I just quickly jump back to GarageBand, uh, I, most likely I can hear all the tracks. The, the vocals, you can see that the waveforms are much larger than everything else, right? So 
I have reduced uh, my volume over here. The man, broken and so in order for you all to hear, I'm going to move the project volume. Glorious land, wounded for So at this volume, I can actually hear Death has lost its day, redeemed yeah, so as you can to stay. Uh, then you, you know, I push this back to uh, zero, right? And then so you're ready. Now the 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 big topic, right? EQ equalization. Your human hearing range extends from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. And within these two extremes, uh, of course, you can ignore the, ignore the subsonic and the supersonic because those are the outside of the limits of our human hearing. Um, broadly, this is a broad classification of uh, the kinds of sounds that uh, occur in these ranges of frequencies. So, right, you have bass from 20 to 100 plus 150. You have upper bass here in the 200s uh, mid-range. So, from the mid-range to the upper mid-range uh, and a bit of that a bit of that high end sits your human voice, right? So, guys would be more of the mid-range over here. Then, ladies would have a, a wider range around these frequencies. And, of course, your high end would be like your cymbals and your... I don't know what else occurs in the high end. Uh, symbols. What are very high pitched instruments? Yeah, but but basically this is where uh the the region where the the treble typically resides. So this is just a guide. Uh, if you go online, there are actually many many uh ways to classify. So this is just a, a sample. So some people have lower mid range, upper mid range, lower treble, etc. So this is uh, one of the others that I've found. Um, this table, I think, is, is, is useful in order for us to know when a particular frequency range is excessively boosted. Right. So uh, basically, if any frequency range is excessively boosted, it's going to sound bad. So these are some of the descriptions of how it will sound. Uh, sub bass, you basically, you just feel a lot of the, the 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 energy i think and it will it will sort of crowd out the the mix um bass very obviously everything will be boomy in the lower mid range you will have a lot of muddiness you will it will sound like your band is playing in the closet with a blanket over it or something like that uh so mid range i, I i'm not experienced this yet if it's over boosted the uh, this, the instruments will sound like a horn. Uh, here I've experienced right the upper mid range and the lower treble. If they are over boosted, or your ears will be like, "Oh, I can't listen to this for really long." Like maybe if it's really bad, like you can't even listen to it for the duration of the song. So that will tell you that there's a bit too much treble energy, and of course the sibilant sounds, the harsh s sounds that some vocalists produce, also occur at these ranges from the upper mid-range to the lower treble. Uh, and of course the treble, uh, there are very high trebles, uh, there may be some distortion and hissing. So this is just a, a rough guide as to what happens. Okay. Okay, so now before I demo anything, right? Uh, I'm going to talk very briefly about the terms that I'm going to use. I'm going to show uh, where to manipulate these things as well. So especially the Q factor. So Q factor is basically a numerical value that tells you the range of frequencies that, uh, that are affected. So later on visually, I will show you so that it's easier for you to see or understand. Um, there is boost and cut, which is quite obvious. 
if you move the 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 point up you are boosting and if you move the point down from zero you are cutting that particular frequency uh these two over here uh a high pass filter as its name suggests lets the highs pass so the high frequencies will pass through but the low frequencies will be cut out and the low pass filter only allows low frequencies to pass through so uh, it's the opposite of the high pass so uh, everything that's high or in high frequencies will be cut out okay and then uh, gain is the amount of uh, loudness right in decibels okay so now i will actually demonstrate how to manipulate the eq in GarageBand. Okay, so like I said just now, right, EQ is actually uh, a plugin. So at the track level, when I double click this and I click the smart controls, this pops out. Okay, just now I've shown this. Um, the EQ window is over here. You know, if, if, if the EQ graph is a little too intimidating, you can actually uh, do the same thing here in this. Uh, control window right where it lets you adjust like the amount of lows or mids or highs uh, as well so this correspond to this graph over here now GarageBand has some presets okay don't look at this okay these are my like presets for myself and like different worship leaders but uh, the bottom numbers from one to seven are all EQ EQ presets so if you go to the voice, you can actually see quite a, a wide variety of presets that are available for you to, uh, to use as a starting point for your EQ. So uh, a male lead vocal, for example, will look like this. Right, so uh, as I said just now, uh, this is a high pass filter, right? So whatever is below, you know, 50 and below, everything here is cut out. Actually, 40 and below, uh, they are not here. So I'm just going to demonstrate what the analyzer looks like. Okay, if I'm just solo this, and I play back. He had no form or majesty, button. no king. Wait, am I on the right track? Kingly dick. Oh, wait, it's not switched on. Okay, so the power button uh, allows you to sort of see... Uh, whether or not it's on or off and when it's on you can actually see dignity yep. okay there you go humble and holy so this is in real time as you, back, you can hear uh, despite the frequencies that are rejected by all men broken and condemned so so i'm uh i'm kind of like a in between a, a bass and tenor so I'm like a baritone uh and most of my singing kind of occurs in, in, in this region, right? From the bass region to the, the, the mid-range region. So, um, in the later slide, I will talk about like suggestions for EQ. So now I will show you how to manipulate the EQ first. So if you have this preset set, right? And, and for example, if I want to cut out more of the bass frequencies, uh, this is the high pass filter preset. And when I click on this, right, I can actually drag it right and left. So if I drag it right, that means more of the bass gets cut. Okay, more of the bass gets cut. So you can listen to the to the difference. He had no form of majesty, right? so I'm all the bass. no kingly dignity. So I, I, really want this, so I want to have some bass, otherwise, humble. The entire tone or timbre of your voice changes to something that's not recognizable right so you want to retain that um you want to cut out some of that some of that bass so this is the q factor that i'm talking about so if the q factor is lower okay maybe i won't illustrate with the with the high pass filter it's easier to see with say uh, one of these so for example i'm, I'm boosting at five at 490 or 500 and I just want to boost that particular frequency. 
So I, I move the Q factor up, right? So it affects a narrower range of frequencies, right? So you see the graph change. The higher the Q factor is, the narrower the, the frequency band is affected, right? So this is actually for problematic frequencies. If I see a very sharp peak over here or over here typically for sibilance, it would be very sharp and it would be very narrow. And what I want to do is to use this to identify it so, for example, if... Uh, oh, then uh, right, right, okay, right here, right here. Right, so there's this uh, resonant frequency that may be quite unpleasant. So, what I want to do is, once I've identified it, right? Humble. Uh, for example, if this is sibilance, uh, and I've identified it at 1080 hertz, what I'll do is, I will bring down the gain. Now, the gain is like, you know... Uh, positive right it's it's occurring on the top half of the graph and I, I pull it down so what i'm effectively doing is i'm cutting out this frequency or i'm reducing it by 13 db so i'm making it so soft that it, it doesn't hurt anymore humble and hope humble and hope where is it it's here humble and hope yeah, so you can see that the, the peak has actually gone down very much so um, you, you don't have to do this for, for every single one. So basically, you want to do this. Uh, this is called, I mean, it's cutting before boosting. So the recommendation when you are doing like vocals or in any case, any uh, instrument is to cut first, right? If there are problematic frequencies that uh, are either very loud and very harsh, you can do this. So identify the frequency and cut it by reducing the, the gain and applying a very high Q factor. Okay, so uh, with that out of the way, so, so this is the way to, you have a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, it's like an 8, we call it an 8 band. So you, you have basically these uh, tools for you to adjust uh, specific frequencies. So this is to boost, right? The gain is 4 dB, and this is to cut. I think the recommendation is to not cut or boost by you know more than 5 dB or, or thereabouts because that might sort of change the tone of the instrument or the voice. Uh, unless you are, like what I did before, you are cutting out certain harsh treble frequencies or sibilant frequencies, then you uh, do a very high Q factor, which means that the range of frequencies that are affected is very narrow so that you can just cut out that unwanted harshness okay so in the next few slides uh, are some just some suggestions uh, the guitar tends to sound uh, very uh, boxy or boomy in okay this is a bad this is a <laughs> very bad eq right because it's just boosting a lot of this region so if you see my preset So I switch it on and then I click the analyzer so I can see. So I, I, I like to I like to cut at this region right around 2 to 3 to 300 or 4. Because if I boost it or if I don't apply it, actually now it doesn't sound so bad, but uh, in certain situations the, the there's this boxiness or boominess that typically occurs at this at this problem sort of problem frequency. So I like to sort of uh, cut it a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so that's a recommendation for guitars. Uh, so like I said for vocals just now, which I demonstrated, you cut before boosting. Uh, maybe limit yourself to to a couple of dBs. Uh, use the analyzer, which I've demonstrated just now, to identify any sharp or problematic frequencies. Okay, so uh, this is just some suggestions to, to, to begin your EQ journey uh, for guys and girls, males and females. So if you want to hear the effects of the boost or cuts very dramatically, you can vary the gain, like what I did just now. So I, I, I really boosted the gain to like 13, 15 dB. Uh, and of course, listen to it with the EQ on and off, right, which is this power button over here. 
so that you can hear what the EQ is actually doing to the track. You know, is it changing the tone uh, too much? And if so, then you know maybe you want to try to dial back the EQ a bit. Okay, what I like to do with the bass and drums is kind of like a like a uh, something I learned from from my from my church uh, sound guy uh, sound uncle, which is uh, for the bass and the drums because the the drums right the kick is typically occurring at the same frequencies at, as the bass, so typically in like the seventy to hundred hertz region. So I would apply a high pass filter in the sub bass frequencies, right? So uh, let's look at the bass. Switch it on. And then I would boost. And I would like to boost with a narrow Q, right? So I'm going to push this up at 80, maybe about, yeah, 14 is, is fine. Maybe not so much, uh, 4 dB. So you can see if you can hear the difference. So you have a bit of that, that punch and that, like that body. So you want to hear like the effect. And for the kick, so same thing, I apply a high pass shelf. And then I boost that 100, right? So I can. Factor is the same as 14. So right now you can kind of like hear right so so both are very defined. You can hear the bass, there is some presence and punch. Uh, the drums also can be heard, the kick can be heard clearly, and they don't kind of like you know jumble up with each other. So if I if I switch both off, right, you can see it. I think it's, it's a bit less defined and the bass is just uh, not as uh, punchy that there isn't that body and that presence right so this is what uh, EQ can can do for you can really bring out a, a certain tone or a certain body of the instrument uh, yeah and so hopefully you know some of these things uh, can help you begin your your journey uh, in, in playing around with EQ on your own. Okay, so we are done with equalization finally. Uh, and we move on to compression. So now compression is kind of uh, more straightforward. Okay, we don't have to mess with any graphs. Uh, just a recap, right? The greater the compression, uh, the smaller the difference between the volume of the softest and the loudest parts of the track. So what we're trying to do is to achieve a more consistent volume that we can work with in the mix. Now, compression is applied at an individual track level, right? And as well as a master track level. So master track, I'll cover later when I, I, I at the nearer the end of the, the presentation. So I will show you um, compression at the individual track level first. Uh, what you have to know is that uh, when you apply compression across your entire project, across all your tracks, uh, it will help make your tracks sound more cohesive. Right, because you are compressing the entire track and not just compressing, sorry, compressing the entire mix and not just compressing the, the individual track. Okay, and uh, a note here is that you can see how much compression is being applied uh, with the blue light meter. So this is again in the control window that you can see 
or how much volume is being put back at the loudest parts of the track. So um, because my uh, recorded vocal is really loud, okay, so you can see that the, the waveform is really large, right? So it's pretty loud. If I'm at 0 dB, it's going to be like... It's kind of overpowering. So uh, I pull out the... Sorry, here. The track controls. So I go back to track and controls, right? Just now I was in EQ. Go back to the controls. Uh, and here, this is the, the, the magic switch, right? And this is the knob that adjusts the amount of compression that you want to use. So, uh, as it is playing, you can see how much compression is being You are our you see the blue light lights up. Holy hope Jesus victorious. You will also notice that uh, without me adjusting the volume fader at a maximum compression, right? Uh, the volume of the lead vocal actually goes a little bit softer. Yes, sin, death has lost its right, it actually sounds a bit more uh, uh, refined. So if I solo this to let you hear the difference, um, at for our sins, you are our only hope to live. Jesus. So you can see that the, the, the loudest parts actually rain in. There's a bit more consistency and it sounds a little less raw sounding. Yep. So this is what uh, the compressor does for the individual tracks. So uh, you have to adjust to taste, right? And how you want to sort of get the tracks to gel together. Uh, not every track will require so much compression. Usually I will uh, start with maybe uh, the down, maybe 40 to 50%. And to see whether uh, the the recorded track requires any. So typically, you will need some compression if uh, the loud parts are very loud and the soft parts are really soft. Okay. Yeah, that's it, right? Compression. And we move on to reverb. Uh, one thing to I forgot to to share is that. Uh, the plugin window over here, right? This shows you all the plugins or all the effects that are applied on your track. So on my lead vocal, right, I apply a noise gate, right, which is here. Uh, I switch on the compressor, which is here. Uh, the EQ as well, right? We did some EQing just now. So uh, when it's highlighted in blue, it means that it's switched on, right? There's a power button here. If you decide that you want to switch it off, you can do so here. So this also co correlates to the switch over here on your control interface. Uh, and uh, if you click this arrow button, of course, there are a host of other things that you can play around. Um, yeah, I shan't go into them because uh, then that would take the entire night, I think. Uh, I, I myself have not used every single thing. Uh, some of these relate to like guitar amps and pedals, uh, distortion, different EQs, etc., etc. But I will highlight one later that I find very useful. Uh, the de sorry to jump around. The, the, when I talked about vocals just now, the de here you have to identify the frequency at which the harsh sounds are occurring. So that's the reason why I said to use the EQ graph and the analyzer to try to identify it. So for example, if a singer is singing a lot of S sounds like in your presence, and then the, the, the S sound is jumping out at you. You just loop that particular S sound that, that really jumps out at you. You switch, switch on your EQ graph and you will be able to see when the S sound occurs, you see which particular frequency it's jumping out at. So then you can use the de more effectively when you move over to the controls, right? When you switch on the de you can adjust at which frequency it needs to be suppressed and by how many decibels. So I would usually uh, recommend uh, anything from uh, maybe 6 dB, because if you suppress it very drastically, like 20 dB, uh, you will realize that your treble frequency range will 
will sound a bit weird because every time there is music that occurs at that frequency, it will be drastically cut. So go for something that's more conservative. Okay, reverb. Okay, we are, we are getting to the end. Uh, reverb is controlled at a track level by two knobs, right? There is a, an ambiance knob and a reverb knob. Now, the ambiance knob is a very short reverb uh, that is used to increase, I think, uh, intelligibility of, say, like, you know, the words or the articulation uh, and, uh, of course, adjust the taste. Um, the reverb knob is a small room reverb that is applied to individual track. So this helps your track sound less raw and dry. So let's listen to this. So my reverb knobs are at zero now. I mean, they are not switched on. So uh, you have to listen to my voice again. He had no form or majesty, so the no kingly dignity. There's a bit of that presence and, you know, a bit more humble uh, and holy. There's the reverb, like, even though it's Despised, very short, it makes it a bit rejected by. That means that it doesn't sound too. Uh, uh, there is. Uh, it sounds like you are singing in in a room, and not like you are singing in a vacuum. By all men broken so reverb, and no? condemned. It's much more uh, glorious land. So it starts to sound weird when you max out your reverb, right? Then you know you are you are singing in a cathedral, but you are not, you know, and it's not intended for you know the song doesn't intend for you to to sound like you're singing in a, in a, in a cathedral. Of course, there are some contextual uses for this. You know, if you're mixing a choir, you want to make them sound like they're singing in a cathedral. You can adjust reverb to make them sound like that. Uh, but here the reverb knobs are are simple. So my general rule of thumb is that when I was playing with this, usually I don't go beyond 50%. Yeah, so anything from maybe 20 to 40% for, for both knobs would be a, a, a good conservative estimate. Now, for reverb, there is also a master reverb. So these two reverb knobs are applied at an individual track level. But for reverb, there is here, if you see on the left, there is master echo. The box is checked. Of course, you can switch it off if you don't want any master echo. And a master reverb. So this volume fader allows you to adjust the amount of echo that is applied on the entire track itself. Or sorry, on the entire mix itself. So how much of the, the, the echo you want to hear on this track? So there is a uh, echo and reverb. So echo is like I said just now, uh, it's like a delay effect, right? So let me just show you what it sounds like. He had no form of man. So you suddenly hear a, another copy of yourself singing, right? If you move it to the max. Uh, so delay is meant to be used in small amounts. Majesty. So there's a bit of that, you know, that that uh, that tailing, right? That, you know, you haven't really finished singing and there's a bit of that, the end of, of the, the phrase that you, you are hearing after it's, you, after you have finished singing it. Uh, of course, the master reverb. No kingly dignity. This is a larger room reverb, right? The master reverb is a larger room reverb meant to, uh, if applied to every track in small amounts, it's meant to sort of make the whole track sound more cohesive. So, uh, just for fun, I just want to humble and holy. It sounds a, a bit strange, right? Despised, rejected by all. So this is like too much. I mean, like, uh, yeah, it starts to sound a bit strange. So, uh, used in small amounts, uh, anywhere from, yeah, around this region, I think would be quite safe. Okay, so like the master track compressor, master reverb will help you make your tracks or instruments sound like they are located in the same room. So again, make, making your mix sound more cohesive. Okay, so good rule of thumb is to stay conservative like most things. Uh, 
if you're unsure, you know, just move it to the max and then you slowly reduce, reduce, reduce. Uh, the, the, the rule of thumb is to, once you hear the reverb, you back it down a few notches or a few dB so that you, uh, it's, it's a sort of like a safe zone. Okay, too much reverb will make it sound like it's underwater, it's muddy. Uh, too little will make it sound dry. Um, I recently heard a, a mix, I think there wasn't any reverb on the individual tracks, so they sounded, like the vocalists sounded like they were all in different rooms, like different size rooms. So it sounded a bit like disconcerting, like wait, they are singing together in a song, but then, yeah, they're all in different rooms. Okay, so that's, that's, that's it for reverb. Uh, panning, right, we are reaching the end. Panning, left and right, very straightforward. Uh, this knob, L, R for left and right. Uh, and here, if I so this is strange. I mean, nobody pans the their lead vocal unless you want to have some interesting effect. Uh, so what I said here is, uh. Typically, the rhythm section, the bass and drums don't get panned, right? This is because your stereo image needs to stay balanced. What I mean is that if you pan your bass to the left or your drums to the left, then the right side of your stereo space will not have any bass frequencies. So it will sound very strange, right? So you want your bass frequencies to anchor uh, your x-axis, right? The entire uh, floor of, of your stereo space. Uh, the same goes for like lead vocals, right? Unless you are going for some interesting effect. Uh, lead vocals usually stay in the center as well as the synth or the pads. Uh, so what is pen? Like typically acoustic guitars, maybe slightly off center, uh, keyboards and pianos as well. Background vocals as well, kind of like you imagine them singing on the left and right of the lead vocalist. So uh, you can apply some light panning for uh, uh, a larger sort of stereo effect, like you can sort of imagine the singer singing to the left and right. Uh, so one thing to note is don't uh, hard pan, don't pan 90 degrees to left or right because there are some uh, devices, right, or when people play back like, uh, I don't know, cars, no, but car is stereo. So there are some uh, devices uh, that are perhaps maybe a single speaker, uh, some of your sounds that are panned to the left or right too hard may be, a, may be reduced in volume or you may, may, may be lost in some way uh, because of this uh, mono compatibility issue. Yeah, so I won't go into uh, technical detail, but so just avoid uh, hard panning. Number six, resting. Okay, this is very important. Uh, your ears get tired, right? They get fatigued. So please rest your ears. Uh, if you're mixing for long periods of time, I think, you know, you want to protect your ears for the long run. Uh, so uh, be sure to rest. And of course, when you rest and you come back to it the next day, you know, you might hear things that you may not have heard before because of your ear uh, listening fatigue. Uh, and again, also get input from other ears. So uh, in, my, in my mixing journey, I've, constantly you know texting people to ask them for feedback and you know how can i mix better so this is actually uh, everyone's on the, on on a journey of learning like, which is what my uh, sound engineer uncle in church also uh, says so we you know I, I i i was telling him that you know I, i'm learning new things every day when when i'm mixing as well okay once we are done mixing, you're happy with the mix, you have applied your EQ, your compression, your reverb, you're ready for it to be shared and you know, sent to, to the person you know, doing your Sunday service or, or someone to, to, listen, to listen to. The master track controls are over here. So here we've been looking at the track tab. There is a master tab that has all these plugins, right? So it says here, used to add more sound processing. Uh, there's a channel EQ, right? Which is uh, more or less the same as what we've, we've talked about, right? Just that this EQ is not applied to the entire track. 
Okay, so what the compre there are two compressors at work, right? This squeeze knob is actually a compressor, right? So squeeze, I think this is the idea of how much or how tightly you want to squeeze your tracks. So I think that's what the word squeeze represents. So this is the first compressor over here. Um, this knob over here is called the exciter. The exciter is a plugin that um, adds high frequency content above a certain uh, above a certain uh, frequency. So in this case here, the frequency is at five thousand six hundred hertz. So above this frequency is adding some extra harmonic content. Okay, it sounds a, a lot of technical terms. Basically, it makes your track sound brighter by adding some extra treble trebly stuff. Yeah. So by default the squeeze is arrowed here and the bright is arrowed here. Right. So 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 you know when I first started I just trust garage band defaults. Is it, I mean it is sound pretty pretty decent. Um compression here so same thing the blue light lights up. This is the second layer of compression. Uh the blue light lights up when it's applied. Humble and holy. Yeah, and the last one is a is what uh, we call a limiter, right? Uh, without going into very technical detail about what a limiter does, right? Uh, uh, if you put it very simply, it's used to increase your overall volume, and also it's meant to catch the loud peaks in the song. So if there are extra loud portions of the song uh, that the compressor doesn't catch, then the limiter is supposed to catch it to make sure that these loud portions are controlled and they don't sound all over the place. Okay, so once we are done, uh, I typically will just switch on because EQ, unless there's a specific frequency range that you want to boost or cut, uh, I, I wouldn't apply it. Uh, I would apply the compressor the exciter also, yes and no, it depends. So you can just play around, you switch it on and switch it off and play around with the with the knobs and to see what uh, sounds the best to you. So I would uh, switch the these four things typically on. Okay, then, then you're done, right? Then you're ready to send the song out as, as a song. Uh, you go to share and then export song to this. Okay, I, I'm almost done, right? We are almost there. Okay, just one last note right here. When you export song to this, okay, now what, which file format do I export to? Uh, you have four options here. AAC, MP3, AIFF, WAVE, WAVE. And of course, they tell you like low quality, mid, uh, medium quality, high quality. Uh, the quality will affect the, the size of the file as well. But I, I typically try to stick to high quality. Uh, it's in the number of bits. Uh. So uh, if you want to sort of uh, read out a little bit more, I think Justin covered this in his previous uh, audio production seminar about uh, sample rate and bit depth, I think. Yeah. So I, I mean, I just for, for ease or convenience, just high quality. Okay. Then I, I, I named the file, uh, a note on the file formats. So AAC and MP3 are compressed formats. So these compressed formats are, have small file sizes. So your typically MP3 file is like you know three to five megabytes. And uh, what happens in the compression is that the, the less critical or audible audio information is like removed or, com or compressed. Uh, so if you use an analogy, you know, if you go to YouTube, there's like 480p, uh, 640, uh, 1080, then 4K. So this is like the 480p, right? Whereas the lossless formats, which is AIFF and WAVE, uh, WAVE is, I think, most commonly used uh, in audio production. So this is like your 4K, right? All your audio information is intact as you've mixed it and as you've recorded it. Um, and But the file size is typically very large. So it's like maybe 10 times the, the file size of your typical MP3. Uh, AIFF, I think, is a, is a Apple, is a... Yeah, it's a lossless format associated with Apple. So my suggestion is just simply MP3 for sharing, uh, WAVE for maybe uploading to YouTube or, or if you're uploading for your church service, you send it to uh, as WAVE for your sound guy. 
Okay, and we are done. So the recap, uh, we talked about sound. Uh, we talked about what mixing is. We've gone through some basic principles of mixing. Uh, we've covered the components. Uh, I've demonstrated each of how these components work. Uh, and uh, you don't have to be too dogmatic about you know which order you know do I do EQ first or like revert first? Uh, you can just do whatever is comfortable for you. I mean, after a while, I think you will uh, have uh, a process like, which you which you will stick to. But uh, what I've covered in the PowerPoint slides are a rough guide and uh, something to sort of get you started on on this uh, whole mixing and you know using GarageBand. And lastly, the exporting and file formats we also talked briefly about. All right, thank you for your attention. Uh, for further reading on mixing, uh, these are some of the more, these three are some of the more uh, accessible articles that you can read that, they, that talk about mixing. Uh, there's also a frequency chart over here that you can use to reference when you are looking at EQ and looking at where instruments sit on the frequency spectrum.